It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 293 of Science on Top. Today's Tuesday, the 27th of April. No, it's not. Today's Tuesday, the 17th of April, 2018. I'm Ed Brown and joining me today is Lucas Randall. Hey. And composer and sound designer Peter Miller. Hello. And today we'll be taking a look at the songs whales make, the risks of having a colony in the Alpha Centauri system, and what happens when you eat the world's hottest chilli. But first, you can help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. You can choose your level of support, which gets you different rewards, and we're very grateful to all the listeners who have uh, signed up to help us out. Okay, Peter, let's talk whales. We've all heard the songs of the humpback whale, the high-pitched squealing that can summon angry intergalactic probes that mess with Earth's environment until someone can fly a stolen Klingon bird of prey and travel back in time to the 20th century. Look, anyway, the point is, we all know the song of the humpback whale. But researchers have now had to listen to a lot of the songs from bowhead whales, which turn out to be a lot more varied and complex than humpback songs, aren't they? Yeah, well, it turns out that... um bowhead whales have a, a different kind of song uh, and uh, really just thanks to fairly recent uh, technology they've been able to um, get some idea of what the what the bowhead whales are, are doing so all this research comes out of uh, the University of Washington the applied physics laboratory uh, and professor uh, Kate Stafford and her team and they've been studying the whales um, off the uh, in the Arctic off the coast of Greenland for uh, about four years uh, to uh, to just to have a have a listen to what they're doing and been able to put uh, little recording devices down there and and get a very um, long period of time where they've recorded them over over these years and been able to compare each year to the next year and it turns out that the uh, the bowhead whales uh, do something quite different to the humpback whales. Humpback whales uh, tend to have a song which they develop over over their uh, breeding season, I believe, and that song is kind of one song, and that goes for that whole that whole season. Uh, but the bowhead whales are slightly different, where they have many many different uh, melodies, which uh, distinct melodies, and can repeat over the, over the one season, but then they never use them again. So, And they've counted up to 184 distinct different melodies uh, over in each year. So that's quite, um, quite something, I think. Uh, and they say that these are things are not, these are not instinctual things. These are things that the whales have to learn. So they, mm. they learn them and then they somehow or other pass them on to other whales, one must assume. So that's uh, it's quite good. It is. It makes you wonder, like, there's, there must be some sort of a purpose. Now, maybe it is just that they like singing and they sort of have a sort of a bonding experience with the singing. Or is it maybe some sort of a way of remembering where to go to, um, to breed and where, to, where they have their spawning areas or whatever? Maybe it's like a memory thing because that whole having to teach your children the song which is what they do, I think is fascinating. Yeah, it certainly made me think of the Lynn Kelly, uh, you know, conversations yeah. we had about the, about the song lines and so forth. So imagine if they, they had that sort of intelligence that they were encoding, um, you know, important places or, or predator information or mm. things like that. That would be awesome. Mm. I was reading uh, one of the things that Professor Stafford was saying uh, is that, you know, these environments are very, very, uh, this is winter in, in the Arctic, so it's, they're deep under the ocean, it's very, very dark, uh, and so the sound is a very important part of the whale's uh, communication, and, and obviously the, that sound travels quite a way under, underneath the water, so it's an interesting uh, concept to think of this very dark environment and all these, these evolving songs, so it's hard not to see that they'd have some kind of purpose. Uh, but, of course, uh, being able to decipher that as humans is going to be <laughs> fairly difficult, I, I would imagine. But also interesting that it's it's a very uh, different 
process to uh, how the humpback whale um, uses its melodies. So there's something completely uh, different going on there, I think. Also, the bowhead whales are really quite tragically, um, these particular ones, uh, which are called the Spitzbergen bowhead whales, are close to a, uh, extinction. There, there used to be around 50,000 of them, they believe, before in pre-whaling days, but now there are only at 100 individuals. Oh, just, whoa. Yeah, it's a big loss to that, that uh, ecosystem, huge. I would think. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned humpback whale songs, uh, which can often go for you know, 20 to 30 minutes. But these bowhead songs, they can only be like 45 seconds or two minutes long. Mm. But yeah, they'll they, repeat those songs a lot over and over again. That seems to be the thing, yeah. They're, they're, they're sort of a, it seems to be not so much a, a lengthy kind of telling of a story like the humpback whales um, mm. uh, method seems to be, but it more of a, they've been saying in the, in the uh, science journals, it's lot more like jazz. It's more like an yeah. improvisation, uh, you know, sort of, sort of on the spur of the moment kind of thing, but still not just random because these, these, patterns re will repeat so they are actually learning them they're they're, they're quite obviously quite um uh, precise and and have a meaning because they are being repeated but uh much shorter and much more varied much more varied which also sounds like jazz you know there's there's often repeats and repeats and repeats and then yeah. organizations and yeah mm. Well, Variations. Uh, Professor Stafford, you know, has, has said uh, in in the writing that she's done that, that they, they need to do more research, of course. But, of course, it's very difficult in that environment where you have this um, very, obviously, very cold water, very dark water. And so they're not even sure whether the whether the same whales are doing these things or whether mm. different whales are learning them. or you know, They can't tell. They're only recording the actual sounds. And they also don't know whether, you know, whether it's all the whales or just the males. Uh, you know, they just the females you know they can't really tell any of that sort of stuff yet either so um, there's further research uh, to be done to to kind of get some better idea of exactly what's going on down there I think. it could be just sort of the wild version of oh oh it's cold it's cold it's cold it's cold oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 <laughs> when is this water going to warm up <laughs> uh sooner than you think <laughs> oh um Ooh, yeah sorry <laughs> Always got to go dark. The whales may not be the only ones going extinct. Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, Lucas, do you want to tell us why the Alpha Centauri system might not be a great place to go and start a colony? Yeah. Apart absolutely. from the fact that we won't be able to do it for hundreds and hundreds of years. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so cast your minds back, if I could play some little harp music for you now, to, to an episode uh, back in uh, 2016, August to September 2016, when we, we covered the uh, um, discovery of a planet orbiting Proxima B. So um, uh, Proxima Centauri, sorry, the, the, the Proxima B is the, uh, the planet, the name of the planet. Proxima Centauri is, is a star, a red dwarf star that, that is, uh, appears to be gravitationally bound to uh, the Alpha Centauri A and B star system. Um, so it's... All in, all indications are that Proxima is actually in orbit around those other stars, um, but it's but it's quite a, a, a way out that you know compared to the other ones. So it's not a hundred percent sure yet whether this is gravitational bound, but it certainly does appear that it is. So back and, that, and that am I right in thinking those are that that's the closest star system to to our star system? Is that correct? That's right. So the Alpha Centauri system, which is about four and a bit, four point three something or other um, light years from us is the closest star system we know of. And potentially Proxima Centauri could at times be the closest star to us because of its quite, you know, uh, eccentric orbit away from the, and wide orbit away from the other the other uh, systems. So if it is in fact orbiting around them, it will slingshot at times closer to us than they, they are, if that makes sense. Wow. So, uh, so it is actually our closest star as far as we know. Now, mind you, I mean, these these red dwarves are, are really dim. They're, 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 you can't see them in your your naked eyes. So you kind of you have to be looking uh, with with instruments to to see them in the first place. So it is within the realms of possibility that there could be a red dwarf closer to us that we just haven't found, um, uh, because you know the ways that we find things close by really are to do with movement. And if the star 
you know, if there was a star closer to us that is not moving obviously at a different rate to the background of stars behind it, we mightn't necessarily see it, especially since it's so dim. Um, and it wouldn't rest necessarily be interacting with anything else because there ain't nothing else apart from the interstellar medium and bits of the Oort cloud and stuff between us and there anyway. So, mm. but that's a little segue, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, so we did cover the uh, discovery of what, what was since named Proxima B, which is this star, this, uh, this planet around Proxima Centauri. And, and, and the big news, of course, was not only the fact that it was there, but that it was a kind of roughly Earth mass uh, planet, something like one, one and a half, 1 1.3, 1, 1. 1.4, something like that, uh, times the mass of Earth. And given the, um, uh, given what we, we could, we could calculate about it by, by its interactions, it appeared to be quite close into, uh, the, the, uh, red dwarf, which means that it would have been in, in that stars, you know, effectively the Goldilocks zone, as we, we talked about that, that habitable zone, because a, a red dwarf puts out way less, um, heat, than um, than a sun like uh, a, a sun like star. So as a result, in order for its planets to be in that nice little sweet spot of warmth, it has to be way way closer to the star, and that that appears to be the case for this planet. So it was like, of course, that led to a whole lot of uh, um, you know conjecture as to whether this this planet might potentially harbor life. Uh, if it is in the habitable zone, then that means that liquid water can exist at least in some parts of the planet. There was discussion about well what would it actually look like if it was there would it be gravitationally locked for example to the star so if you if you've got something that's that's tidally locked it would be showing one face to the star at all times and if that's happening like mercury or like the moon to earth and stuff if that's happening then um maybe it's habitable the, the habitable part of that planet might be sort of in a ring around what's effectively the the sunset sunrise sort of ring around the planet maybe that's the only place that you could actually have life living well all conjecture of life on this <laughs> planet has maybe been made mute by the detection recently of a super flare, a very large super flare, which temporarily made Proxima Centauri something like 60 plus times the normal brightness in the sky, which was enough to make it visible to the naked eye uh, from Earth. Um, so. This is a, like a solar flare in our sun, a, a sort of an ejection of, uh, of particles from the sun, uh, but on a much bigger scale. Is that what we're talking? Yep. So basically, it, uh, just quoting here from one of the stories, briefly boosted the star's brightness by a factor of 68. Um, and it, imagine, you know, so a solar flare is when you have a, a star, um, you know, throwing out it's usually when those those man magnetic lines basically snap. You know, you see these big, great big rings that 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 come out from from the star. And if you look at it in the right uh, wavelengths of light, you can see these these promises that come out. And they and if the magnetic field lines uh, suddenly break, effectively, I can't really think of a better way to put it. They can then throw these these uh, flares out towards you know the the out, out from uh, from the star so if they happen to be pointed at a planet um that can be very bad news so if it, for example if our own star does send and we've talked about the carrington events and other things like that in the past um you know the, the impact that it could have on modern society would be significant but something as big as this flare when you consider how close proxima b is to its star this would have the impact of basically stripping all of its, um, if it does have ozone, well, you can kiss that goodbye. Um, ozone has a pretty important role here on Earth. Um, it it's really is our protection against UV. So if we do have a particularly large solar flare or, or a coronal mass ejection that, that, that's pointed at Earth, uh, it can strip away our, our UV shield. And once that happens, obviously then we're exposing uh, all of life on Earth to, you know, cancerous uh, UV uh, at, at much, much higher levels than than we can sort of handle. Um, not to mention wreaking havoc with, um, well, all of our electronics and all that sort of thing. But, yeah, not great news for, for life in that respect, but it gets worse. So, a, so you, couldn't, you couldn't sort of just put on the SPF 50 or something? <laughs> Wouldn't help you then, right? <clears throat> Not, not really. I mean, the thing is, with something like this, if you are going to, if, if it did, if Proxima B did have an atmosphere, 
that was that, that included uh, an ozone layer, for example, um, then then the the be a global event that would strip that away very very quickly and they reckon that a flare like this would probably strip away um uh you know the atmosphere uh, sorry the 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 uv protection um pretty much just from that one event like 90 percent of it could disappear from it bang it would it would build up again you know if it if it, if it was being generated in the first place but that would be bad is this the first time they've actually seen something like like this from from uh, proxima centauri I, this seems like a quite a remarkable event. No, it's not the first time. So the, they had previously spotted t- uh, 23 less powerful flares over the past couple of years. Uh, right. So this flare, that, that this really large flare, um, actually occurred be- around the time, like in, when you consider um, how far away it is, so we're looking 4.2 or so light years away, 4.2, 4.3, Um so around the time that we were taught, we we discovered this planet, um, that was around the time that the flare apparently left us. A bit, bit vague on that, but anyway. So um, if if you were to continue pummeling the planet with this type of uh, event, not only would you strip away the uh, the ozone, you would in fact strip away the atmosphere itself. Um, that would not be a thing anymore for them, <laughs> um, and that that. You know, that's something else that we kind of think is important because without atmosphere, you haven't got atmospheric pressure. Without atmospheric pressure, you haven't got water in its liquid form. Pretty much you go straight from ice, you know, through that sublimation process to uh, to steam. And then... Well, there, there'd be a fair bit of radiation probably as well. Oh, yeah. Like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a fairly... Um, negative pressure on any sort of evolution happening on a planet. You would think so. by as well, because that wouldn't get a chance to start. Yeah, exactly. But you've got, on one hand, you've got um, a system, because these stars, these red dwarfs are incredibly long lives. They'll be the last stars that survive. You know, there'll be red dwarfs, white dwarfs, which, of course, are the dead cores of, of, of um, once much larger stars, are basically great big glowing diamonds, and you'll have um, black holes. Eventually, you'll just have the black holes, and even they'll they'll sort of um, demise uh, through Hawking radiation release. Uh, to link back to an earlier conversation before we started recording. Keep it light. <laughs> <laughs> um, Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, so so th- these things live for an incredibly long time, which which of course is is um, you know makes you think. Well, if life is going to develop in these um, systems, then they've certainly got time on their side, but they don't have a, a, a gentle sort of uh, shot at it. They don't have stability. These these little these little red dwarfs are really tempestuous. They will throw out a lot of flares all the time. There's a lot of activity going on all the time, and um, so and you know what you were saying. The planet's got to be uh, closer to be warmer. That's right. They, what's what's their gravity like? I mean, do you also have a problem with gravity as well? Uh, in terms of the the planet's gravity the star. affected by the star, no, the star. Yeah, just the fact that I mean, so if if the planet is closer in to the star, um, you know, <clears> the, the gravity of that star is is going to be very important to our, how it affects that planet as well, isn't it? Well, the the main impact of that in terms of that the uh, the distance from the star is that it's very likely to be gravitationally locked, so so a tidal lock. So that's when you've got one face of the planet yeah. facing the star at all times, like the moon is to right. us. Um, yeah. And so so that, that, of course, has implications for habitability as well because it would mean that, for example, if you did have an atmosphere to speak of, you would probably have quite significant temperature gradient between one, one side of the planet and the other, which could then lead to quite um, amazing storms. And, 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 you know, just think of air moving around because air, air, you know, it's, it's heat that drives that sort of thing. Um, but even if you didn't have a thick atmosphere where that was an issue, then you'd, you'd probably saying, well, directly on the sun, on the star facing side is going to be pummeled by radiation constantly and far too hot for life. The other side is going to be far too cold in all likelihood. Therefore you end up with this ring that's that's like imagine all, uh, the sunset at any given time around Earth. You've got a ring of sunset or sunrise, depending on how you look at it. That's uh, right around the planet. That's probably would be that planet's habitational space. Mm. With this 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 
this planetary Goldilocks zone, if you like, which is a ring around the planet. And that would be the same all the time because the thing is gravitationally locked. Mm. But apart from that, no, the, the gravity itself wouldn't cause any, any drama. It wouldn't cause time dilations or massive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's certainly not, not a very friendly uh, environment. But, look, it doesn't mean it's off the cards by any stretch because, as we know on Earth, we keep finding more extreme extremophiles um, that can, you know, that, that can exist in the most absurd circumstances. So we don't know yet. And that's just based on the life. You're resistant to UV and things like that. Yeah. You never know. You never know. Uh, Also, it mentions being visible to the naked eye. Now, I'm assuming that means an observer on the planet would have seen the solar flare with their naked eye. Not that we could see it from Earth. Oh, no. It means we could see it from Earth. No, it meant we could see Proxima Centauri from Earth. That's how bright this this solar, this super flare was. So it made that star really bright, the star brighter by a factor of 68%, uh, by a factor of 68, sorry, which is 68 times, 68 times more bright than normal. So if you're looking in that direction, you would have noticed something happen. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, very, very bright. It says in the flares immediate aftermath, observers under dark skies would have been able to see the star with the naked eye, which is pretty much unheard of for red dwarfs. Um, I'm I'm bummed I missed it now. Yeah. I know. If I'd known. <laughs> so they reckon that um, based on, on the, the observations that they've seen and the 23 other um, flares over the last two years, they reckon it probably blasts things out like this perhaps five times a year. Mm, wow. Not not good. Not good for uh, for life. No. No. But still, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> awesome for us because we're a long way away. From- long way away. It can throw all its little tanties that it wants, and we can just watch from afar. Yes. Something to bear in mind if we wanted to do a lost in space style colony on Alpha Centauri. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Peter, a recently published case study has detailed the nasty effects that one man in New York State suffered after eating a Carolina Reaper, <laughs> which in 2016 was the hottest chili in the world. There have been hotter chilies since then, but it was still a pretty nasty one, wasn't it? Uh, yes, I, I'm not really sure what prompts. I mean, I understand that, you know, people do this kind of thing for a dare. Uh, but uh, when see, somebody calls a chili the Carolina Reaper, yeah. <laughs> it is asking for trouble, isn't it? Um, yeah. So anyway, th- this chap apparently thought this would be a really good fun thing to do. Uh, ate one of these, uh, Carol- well, I don't know actually how many he ate. Maybe he ate more than one. Um, and um, uh, had uh, uh, had to be taken to hospital. He was having uh, what, what are called thunderclap headaches, which are uh, caused by uh, s- s- the, the um, restriction of blood vessels in the, in the brain. And uh, they believe that these kinds of headaches have happened before with people eating uh, very spicy chilies. Uh, but this is a, a, a case where they were able to actually definitively say that he had a condition called reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, which then went on to cause the thunderclap headache. So, yeah, don't Was it known things. that he had that prior to this? Uh, they, they think that this... Uh, syndrome was caused by the chili. Wow. So, okay. so the chili actually narrowed arteries in his brain. Uh, and so that's why it's called reversible because, you know, it, it actually happens, but then it kind of recovers. So he was, he was lucky, you know, that it, that it wasn't. Uh, Maybe they should rename this chili to the brain fuck chili. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <Charming>. <laughs> They, um, there's also, uh, you know, there are there are some kind of things in the medical literature of people eating various kinds of uh, chili mm. peppers and having some severe effects. But one kind of wonders whether they might have had preconditions. You know, there, there's been incidents of people having heart attacks and um, also other forms of uh, um, neural problems, let's say. Uh, but uh, yeah, this this one seems to be quite a, an extraordinary. Uh, circumstance. I don't understand 
chili fascination. Maybe we should have Rachel Dunlop on the show at some point <laughs> to explain to well, us. Well, I like chili. I, I like chilies. I mean, I, I'm I actually, like spicy food. Yeah, yeah and I, I will eat quite hot chilies, but I'm not. Yeah, you know, like I eat them because I like the way they kind of work with the food and stuff. But I'm not going to eat something just to, just for the sake of going. Oh yeah. my god, that's the hottest thing I've ever eaten in my life. When you no longer get joy out of it, yeah, yeah. that's a good time to stop. This is pain. But there are people who do seek out hotter and hotter. My son has yet to find something he considers hot enough, and I just find that <laughs> bizarre. Ah. Ah. Well, just keep him away from the Carolina Reaper. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good strategy. Um, that different people will experience it differently because uh, it's, it's as we know it's caused by capsaicin, and different people have a different sensitivity to that capsaicin. So some people might need stronger and stronger doses to get that same effect. Mm. That's why when the original Scoville test was developed in 1912, I think that was uh, done basically by tasting it, going. Yep, that's really <laughs> hot. That's about this point. Yeah. Uh, whereas now they use uh, high perf- high performance liquid chromatography and stuff like to separate the actual components and to measure the concentrations of capsaicin. So there's some science to it now, rather than just you know. Now there is, yeah, yeah. But right. even then, different chilies will have different, different uh, yeah. amounts of water in them, and that water uh-huh. will dull it. So if you have Tabasco sauce which is 95% water and the chili, the rest is chili, that's not as bad as something that is just a raw chili of the same Scoville uh, strength. And people eat them, eat chilies for, for the kind of the adrenaline recovery effect, don't they? Well, no, not, not adrenaline. It's, um, uh, what is it? You know, you get the, op- the, the opioid. Sort of the endorphin. Uh, endorphin. And- that's right. Yeah. That was what I was going for. It's, the, it's that kind of endorphin thing. So, so you eat them and then it's, it's the recovery that feels good to you and it's what gets you addicted to them. As far as I understand. Ad- addicted is, is a strong word. <laughs> I oh, would I hate to be well, addicted look, Rachel Dunlop, to chilies that can nearly kill you. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel Dunlop would say that she was addicted to chilies. I'm pretty sure she would yeah. admit to that. She loves them. She does. And she'll eat them just raw as a snack, like we would eat a handful of nuts. That's so. right. Mm-hmm. It's the sort of thing I actually would really like to learn a lot more about. How does it affect the human body? How does it how does it cause constriction of the brain blood vessels and things like that? What's the chemical pathway and everything of something that you know? Presumably, it, it's ingested. It's not injected into the bloodstream. Obviously, some of it does get to it. But I would like to know a lot more about that as well as you know how you determine how you grow them. Is it all just uh, selective? Uh, breeding and things like that are they genetically modified artificially genetically modified well, yeah, people do, chilies i know for a fact that people do actually grow chilies to try and mm. breed them to be hotter and hotter that in fact yeah, I, would, it, yeah. I would actually make a guess i don't know that in this case but i would make a guess that the carolina reaper has been actually cultured to be you know a particularly hot chili looking at it it looks like something it's sort of like a cross between a um a scotch bonnet and a I'm not sure, but it, it definitely looks like other chilies that I've seen. It looks like it's – I reckon somebody started out with a certain kind of chili and said, "What? Well, how can we make it even hotter? <laughs> yeah. Um, according to Wikipedia, the Carolina Reaper, originally named the HP22B, is a cultivar <laughs> of the Capsicum chinense, chinense plant. Uh-huh. So, yeah, it's one that there's obviously they've – bred it, for want of a better word, to be mm-hmm. hotter and hotter and all that. Uh-huh. Well, I was just reading that uh, apparently it reclaimed the title as the world's hottest chilli in tw- this year, in 2018, because uh, the other one, the Dragon's Breath, the Dragon's Breath uh-huh. turned out to actually have been a hoax. Um, uh-huh. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So apparently um, the person in question used someone else's plants and used fake results. It was a publicity stunt, which the news websites ate up. Where have we seen that before? Uh, wh- <laughs> Every week in science news. Mm. Chili, hot chili wars somewhere going on there. Someone, mm. someone, someone willing to commit crime to have the, the banner of the hottest chili. There's a story in that. All right. As usual, you can find all the links in the show notes or at scienceontop.com slash 293. And if you like, you can tweet about us or post on Facebook and let your friends know 
about the show and why you like it. Don't forget, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate, pledging to support us on Patreon. Thanks for joining me today, Lucas and Peter. Oh, it's my pleasure. No worries. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. I'm supposed to say, Station, this is Will Smith in Savannah, Georgia. How do you hear me? Hey, Will, I've got you loud and clear. This is Drew Foistel. I'm taking over the National Geographic Instagram live from the International Space Station. So, so in terms of like the, the simple basics, right? So you on Earth, you know, people have to poop. You're like, it's important to poop on Earth, right? So when you're up there, I see your microphone floating, right? So I'm just, you know, this is, this is a really basic, you know, this is a deep probing question here. I need to understand what you do with that. Like, how do you manage that? Well, are you sure you want to talk about this uh, this problem? Because it is pretty challenging. Um, <laughs> I like I like to say uh, I like to say you can have a good day in the bathroom, and you can have a really bad day in the bathroom, and you really you hope for the good days. The bad days can be challenging. <laughs>